Hey, Real Life, I cannot tell you how excited I am to be back worshiping with you guys this weekend. And I've been gone for five weeks, and in those five weeks, I've had to basically go to work and then come back to my hotel room every night, not being around anyone, just being isolated in my hotel room for five weeks. And uh, it was a little tough, but throughout that time, you know, on the weekends, I was, I was still worshiping with you guys online. Um, I know a lot of you are doing that now, and, and it, was a, it was a help to me. But, you know, Monday through Saturday, at night, I was just kind of in my hotel room and, and I would pray that God would, that would just keep bolstering me in this time of waiting to come back home to be with you and my family. And the, we were talking about scripture and what we wanted to do and Diane was talking about this one scripture and I started reading and I was like, this is exactly how I feel. So I wanna read it to you. Second Timothy, first one. I thank God whom I serve as did my ancestors with a clear conscience as I remember you constantly in my prayers, night and day. As I remember your tears, I long to see you, that I might be filled with joy. Later he says, for this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying of my hands. So I'm finally back with you guys. Would you sing with me? Will we ask God to fan that flame in our hearts, to set us on fire for him? Let's worship together. This world can be cold and bitter. Feels like we're in the dead of winter. Waiting on something better. Am I really gonna hide forever? as we use this weekend to celebrate our earthly fathers. Let's use this moment right now to lift up our worship, our admiration for our Heavenly Father who gives us life in everything that we have. Worship with us as we sing.
on the ways that you relate to us. We know that you are our creator. And that before we were in our mother's womb, you knew us. And that you are our instructor. That you instruct us in the ways of righteousness. And you are our deliverer. You deliver us from the evil one. But what moves in our heart on this weekend is the fact that you've given us the spirit of adoption whereby we can cry, Abba, Father. You are our heavenly Father. You are our good, good Father. And as a good Father, you love us unconditionally. As a good Father, you continually encourage us to conquer our fears. And as our good Father, we are able to enjoy you and be enjoyed by you. And as a good father, we are able on this day to cast all our cares upon you. So no matter the worry or the situation or the circumstance or the anxiety or the care or the prayer that's on our hearts or on our lips, we know we can lay them at your feet because you truly are the lover of our soul. And Father, on this weekend, we pray a special blessing over the fathers in our lives. We pray, Lord, you encourage them and strengthen them in the Lord. We're so appreciative of their influence over us. Father, we love you. And on this Father's Day, we want to tell you we love you and appreciate you. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen. Thank you so much for joining us for Church Online. Currently, we also offer services under our tent at 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. Sunday mornings, as well as kids' ministry for ages two and up. And again, thank you for helping us maintain all these various ministry methods through your faithful giving. Hey, we also want to make sure that you know that we are still full throttle ahead for our church plant in the California Lexington Park area. If you want to stay connected with us, you can find us on Facebook at Relevant Church, S-O-M-D, as well as Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Oh, and don't forget to like and subscribe. And finally, we would like to get your input on a short survey that we have created concerning our re-entry into our building. This will take less than two minutes. Just stop by our website and click the survey link on the front page. This will be live until Sunday night, midnight. So hurry on over and let your thoughts be known. Now sing with us as we enter back into worship. Are you disappointed? Are you desperate for help? You know what it's like to be tired and only a shell of yourself. You start to believe you don't have what it takes. Cause it's all you can do just to move 
much less finish the race. But don't forget what lies ahead. All those cold brother and falls below. Soon all your burdens will be gone. With all your strength, sister, run wild, run free. Hold up your head. This road will be hard If we win in the end Simply because of Jesus in us It's not if, but when So take joy in the journey Even when it feels long Oh, find strength in each step Knowing heaven is cheering you We are in a series called Meanwhile, and we've been talking about one big overriding question. It's this, what do I do when there's nothing I can do? What do I do about that season of loss we talked about in that first week when we have no idea when things are gonna be restored or brought back the way we so desperately want them to be? Then in week two, we talked about a meanwhile season where God has made a promise to us, but we haven't seen it fulfilled yet. Pastor Mark reminded us that sometimes in that meanwhile season, we're waiting because God is working on our lives. Last weekend, Pastor Chris let us in on a secret for the meanwhile season. It was the secret of learning how to be content in all things. 
And he told us that the secret wasn't found by just digging deeper into ourselves, but rather it came in this desperate reliance on the Holy Spirit who was active in our lives to teach us how to be content even while we are in the meanwhile season. And I bet you've caught on that this is a, a pretty deep series, if you will, for three weeks now. We've been wading through some waters that are getting deeper and deeper. And, and today, if you will, it, it's kind of like we've been walking along a sandbar. Have you ever done this? And as you're walking along, the further out you get, it just gets deeper and deeper and deeper. And then suddenly, there's this next step you take. And when you take that step, you just go all in. You are no longer waiting. You are now fully in over your head. I warn you and I welcome you into what we are about to share together. Today, we're going all the way into the deep end in this series. And so before I say another word, what I'd love for you to do wherever you are at is just to take a moment, if you're able, to just bow your head as, as I lead us in a prayer, and I'd like you just to be praying along with me. And so as we get started, let's pray. God, we need to hear from you. What we're about to receive sounds good when we read it in the Bible, but it's terribly hard to live out when we experience it in our own lives. And so, Lord, today I pray you'll grant us an open heart to embrace this level of spiritual maturity while on this damaged planet until one day we see you. And Lord, for these things in our lives we face, if you aren't going to remove this, then use this. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. If I was to ask you, who's a character that comes to mind more than any when you think about suffering, who would be the poster boy of, of struggle and hardship? I'm gonna give you just a second. If you're home, watch this in the living room, you can kind of confer together and, and get your answer together. And uh, I'll wait just a second. All right, we all have someone in mind, don't we? And so tell me who it is. That person is, I bet many of you said Job. Job, suffering, we equate suffering with Job immediately. And what amazes me is how many of us actually love the book of Job. It's kind of strange if you think about it that we would love that book when you consider that the, the book is suffering from the very start till almost the very end. And not only is it suffering, but it's discussion about suffering that gets no answers. After 34 chapters of talking about suffering, even after God speaks to Job, no answers to these questions about suffering are given. And yet people love that book. Why would that be? I think there's two reasons that we love the book of Job. The first one, and it's a wonderful one, is that Job remained faithful to God throughout all of his pain. I mean, as you read those first few chapters, every day it gets worse than the day before. Even his wife eventually said, Job, give up, toss it over, curse God and die. When his friends gathered around him to counsel him, they actually accused him of guilt or of some kind of hidden sin. And yet Job remained faithful to God. But I think there's another reason that we love the book of Job. And I think it's because his suffering ended and God's blessing poured out. At the end of the book of Job, things turned around. And I mean, they really turned around. In that last chapter, we read, so the Lord blessed Job in the second half of his life even more than in the beginning. Job got a happy ending. It turned out that Job's suffering, as difficult as it was, was for a season. There was a meanwhile season in his life, but when he came out the other side, there was the blessing pouring out. It's a book with a happy ending. We love that. Americans love that. Research says 95% of all movies made here in the United States end with a happy ending. The, the loose ends get all tied up. And after all, that's the way it's supposed to be, isn't it? 
and in reality. If the whole Bible was the book of Job, then we would simply believe that the endings are always happy, that God always works it out in a way that pleases us. But for these few minutes that we have today, we're not going to talk about suffering as it relates to the character of Job. Rather, I want us to take an insightful look into the life of Paul and into a story that Paul is going to share with us about suffering that he went through. And as we look at this story together, Paul's going to try to help us to deal with this question. What happens when it doesn't end happy? What happens when it doesn't end happy? What happens when we don't get all the loose ends tied up? What happens when it turns out that this meanwhile season of our life is something that is permanent? What do you do when you've asked God to bring it all together, but you can see it's just not coming together? What do we do when we've begged God for healing, but the healing never comes? What do we do when we long for restoration, but it just isn't going to happen? We were just sure God's gonna fix it because we can't, but God's not fixing it, at least not the way we hoped he would. What do we do when we face some kind of suffering or pain or heartbreak or heartache that we are going to carry with us all the way until we lay it down in eternity. Now, not every pain or suffering that we face fits into this category. And many of the things that we struggle with in this life have a meanwhile season and then we move through them and out of them. But for some of us today, or for some of the circumstances we face, our meanwhile is beginning to show itself in permanence. And we say, what do we do with this, Pastor Todd, when there's just no change coming or the circumstance can't be changed? And we are so blessed that Paul gives us this wonderful gift of this raw, open honesty of this story in his life that he actually tells to a church that that he loved very deeply and interacted with often, the church in Corinth. And so he shares with them his own experience about how he dealt with something that just wasn't going to change. Let's look at how he started with them. He said, to keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations, there was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Now, those first couple sentences absolutely require us to give some context because we can sense that we've jumped into the middle of a thought here. Paul loved Corinth, but Corinth didn't always love Paul. The Corinthians had a habit of chasing all kinds of teachers and some traveling rabbis would come in and give new ideas. And frankly, there were some that came in and tried to convince the Corinthians, even succeeded at times, that Paul's ministry was not legitimate. They demeaned Paul and his teachings. And so Paul ends up in the verses just prior to the story he's telling, trying to reestablish for them his legitimacy. He does it in two ways. First, he says, do you know how sold out to Jesus I have been? And he gives them a list of all of these struggles and, and heartaches and, and sufferings that he has gone through. Pastor Chris, if you saw last week's sermon, actually listed a bunch of them off, shipwrecked and beaten and stoned and all of them. You can go back and, and see all those things. And Paul said, don't you know, if, if there's anyone ever sold out to God, it's me. But then he does an interesting thing. He also then turns it the other direction and says, and God is sold out on me as well. In fact, he says, I had an experience, an unbelievable experience, mysterious, cool thing happened where I was actually taken up into this seventh heaven. And he says, I literally don't even know if it happened to me physically or if God just like sucked my spirit up there. He says, I don't know, but this I do know. While I was there, God told me such indescribable things that I'm not even allowed to write them down. I'm not sure I could even if I tried. Did you know that today there are things 
that you and I as Christ followers don't even know about God or about the future that Paul knew? It was revealed to him by Jesus himself. And Paul says, this, this really happened to me. If, if you want to know that I'm legit, this really happened. But he says something really interesting. Look at how he says it. He says, so to keep me from becoming conceited. We all would have the temptation to become conceited. Jesus told me something he told none of you. That first word there is to keep me. In other words, the suffering that I'm about to tell you about, Paul says, God had a purpose in it. You see, we could spend all day arguing over the semantics of whether God causes pain or allows pain. And we could spend a, a lot of time arguing together about how much God is to blame for all of this. But here's reality today. We can't let God off the hook when it comes to pain in our lives. He's all powerful and he could have done something to make it different than it is. And Paul recognizes this and he says, even in my pain, God had a purpose. If you were here for the first weekend, remember I told you we'll drive ourselves crazy if in this life we try to figure out all those purposes. I'm not here to encourage you to do that. But I am here to tell you that our God redeems everything in our life, even our pain, even our struggle and our suffering. God puts purpose to it. He won't waste it. That's what Paul's telling us. He says, God's got purpose even in my pain. In fact, he says, so to keep me become, from becoming conceited, there was given to me. Now that's an important word too because this word that Paul uses for given doesn't have a negative connotation. It's not God slammed me with. God punished me with. It wasn't a punishment. It, the word given here has a very neutral aspect to it. It'd be almost like you were laying under a car and you needed the wrench and you said, you know, I asked for the, the box wrench and I was given that wrench. Some of the most powerful testimonies that you will ever hear in your life, something that will inspire those of us who are following Christ or thinking about following Christ, comes from people who are able to get to a maturity level of saying, in this life, I receive that as if it is from God because God has allowed it. And Paul says, God allowed something to go on in, in my life. He allowed a, a, a thorn in the flesh for me, a, a messenger of Satan. Now, we could chase down the rabbit hole of trying to figure out what that is today. I've talked to you some about this in the past and I can tell you that you can Google, don't do it right now, but you can Google what was that thorn in the flesh and you will get scholarly people all over the board. Some will say it was definitely physical. Some will say it was a spiritual attack from Satan. Others would say actually it was just a human attack. It was these enemies that Paul faced that would come against his ministry constantly and he was so exhausted and worn out by that. And so all of these opinions exist out there. Today, I want to tell you that I'm going to operate under what I think is the most biblically founded belief of all because it is actually surrounded and supported by multiple scriptures throughout his letters. I believe that Paul's thorn in the flesh was an extraordinary problem with his eyesight, nigh unto being blind. And in fact, there are even some scriptural indicators that, that talk about the fact that, that Paul maybe suffered tremendous pain as a result of this blindness and that he was tremendously disfigured because of it. We, we even know that the Galatians, that Paul said to the church in Galatia, I know how much you love me because when I was there, some of you even said to me, if we could, we would pull out our eyes and give them to you. And so there is some kind of horrific suffering that's going on in, in, in Paul's life. And so whatever it is, whatever it is, it's very difficult. Because this word thorn means an impaling stake. This isn't, you know, I was deadheading my roses and got nipped by a thorn. 
No, this is, I'm impaled on this. Paul doesn't say I had something that was bugging me. It was slowing me down. It was tiring me out. No, he says, I was tormented by this. I was going through something horrific in my life. Well, well, how bad was it? Well, he goes on to tell us how bad it was. He says, three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. Not, you know, every now and then in prayer, I remembered in passing, oh yeah, and God, that, would you take that thing away? Now this is pleading. This is Paul losing sleep in prayer. This is Paul fasting and praying. This is Paul pacing the room, crying out, screaming towards God, crying and pleading towards God. God, won't you take this away? And when he says, three times I prayed this, that doesn't mean, oh yeah, I wrote it on my Monday prayer list. And so the first three Mondays in April that one time, I prayed for this. No, no, no. The idea here of three times is the idea of completion. It's almost like the fullness of God as the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's the same fullness concept. Paul says, I prayed right through it from beginning through it and to the end. Knowing Paul, he probably talked to God about his calling and said, God, don't you understand how hard it is for people even to look at me when I'm preaching? Lord, it, it dents my ability to do what you've called me to do. And God, what you've called me to do is so big. I mean, I think we could argue today that that Paul had the most important calling of anybody who was walking on the face of the earth at that time. And on top of that, Paul undoubtedly in his prayers said, God, all I'm asking you to do is to do for me what you've done through me. You've used these hands to work miracles on others. Jesus, why won't you just take your hands and work a miracle on me? Lord, why won't you just do for me what you're doing through others as well? You know, one of Paul's contemporaries, of course, is Peter. And there's this really interesting scripture text in Acts chapter five. It says, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. And crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by evil spirits. And all of them were healed. And here's Paul saying, I'm running all over the Greek and Roman world, Lord. And Peter's at home, comfortable in Jerusalem, and he's got his wife and his family. And really, God, the story's come to me that it only takes his shadow to heal people, and everybody's getting healed. And I'm walking around here trying to demonstrate to people that I have the power of Christ in me, and this is what they're looking at? Don't you know what this is doing to my reputation? Don't you know this is sucking everything out of my very life's call and what I'm all about? And so Paul prays through it from beginning to end three times. And then, in exhaustion at the end, he gets his answer. Paul says, finally God answered my prayer. And here's what he said. Paul, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Paul, I've heard your prayers. Paul, I love you. Paul, I'm so proud of what you're doing for me. And Paul, I do know it would mean so much to you if I would just give you what you're asking for. But Paul, I'm not going to give you healing. I'm going to give you grace. Is no ever a better answer than yes when we get it from God? (laughs) To be honest, I, I really doubt that the first time that the Lord told Paul, I'm not gonna heal you, but I'm gonna give you grace, I doubt he was impressed by that. In fact, if he's anything like us, when, when he heard that, I wonder if he didn't just look up to the heavens and say, is that your final answer? Are you sure? Can we renegotiate? Can I go back? Did I not pray it right? Because Paul, just like us, when grace is offered instead of the victory, I think what we honestly say is, God, God, 
I don't want grace. God, I want you to fix it. God, I don't want grace. I want you to restore it. Lord, thanks for that offer uh, of grace, but I wish you would just change it. God, can't you solve it? I can't. In fact, this is the whole reason I brought it to you. If I could solve it, fix it, restore it. Myself, I would have a long time ago. But you're able, and you told me that we should ask, and so, come on, God, fixing it just feels right. Isn't that how the story is supposed to go? Isn't that how the celebration breaks out? Because we get out of the season of meanwhile, God answers and boom, everybody celebrates. A teacher of divinity from Duke, her name is Kate Bowler, is currently experiencing and walking through stage four cancer. And writing about this idea that we think things should always work out, she writes these words. There's a little bit of prosperity gospel in all of us. Each of us, through the accidental narcissism of wanting to be happy, gets confused about what we deserve. Lord, I'm serving you with all my heart. God, it's when I finally gave my life fully to you, then this happened. Lord, don't you want this to work out for me? Haven't I heard the, the preacher preach that if I would just say it right and I would just name it, then I could just claim it and it would happen? And Jesus comes to us and says, I know how hard you've prayed and I know how much you love me and I hope you know how much I love you but the life that I am giving you right now is wrapped in grace, not comfort. What I'm giving you is grace, not solution. I'm wrapping your today in grace, not success. And eventually, Paul made his peace with this. In fact, he did, he did more than make his peace with this. Paul decided to embrace the gift of grace over the gift of the answer he wanted. Oh, it's so mature. What he did, and, and, and Paul eventually says, okay, God, if grace is what I get, then where do we go from here? And here's what he says. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. Paul says something we struggle to believe. He says that weakness can actually be a platform for God's glory. <laughs> that loss and struggle and heartache and suffering and death in our lives can actually become a platform for God's strength to be displayed. <laughs> That's not how we want to write the story. It's not our preferred way to go. Here's how we'd like it to go. We say, God, success story for your glory. Don't you love it? When the guy hits the 430 foot home run over center field in Yankee Stadium and as he's circling the bases, he's pointing to heaven going, to God be the glory for that? Isn't that the story we love? When the man or woman's face is on the front of Fortune 500 magazine and when you open up and read the main article, you discover they've built their business on Christian principles and they give the glory to God for every success they've ever had and you read the article and you close it and you say, how satisfying this is. Don't you love it? When the actress wins the award, when the singer wins the award and when they stand up and hold it in the air, the first thing they say, is I first want to give glory to Jesus Christ who made this possible. And we love that. And we should love that. And it's great. And it thrills us. 
And that's how we want it for us. We want a success story for his glory. What about the possibility that we're facing something like Paul did? And really what it's just going to be is our story for his glory. Is that possible? Can you do the right thing in your business and pour your heart in your business and pray for wisdom in your business and have your business fail and have God still get glory? Can you gather the whole church around and anoint for healing and believe for healing and your child still dies and somehow in the midst of all that, God's gonna receive some glory in the midst of your weakness? Can you take last place? Can, can you not make it on the team? Can you be the seventh best salesman in your office and your office has nine salesmen? Can we still claim somehow that God can receive glory even in the midst of a life filled with wheelchairs or nebulizers or dialysis? Can we pray for a great miracle and not get it? and somehow still believe that that can become a platform for God's strength and his glory? It can happen. If in our weakness, we display the beauty of our unaltering reliance on God that with tears streaming down our face, we can proclaim, I don't know how I'm getting through this, but God's grace is right there. And it's sufficient for me. And somehow in my weakness, even this is going to be a platform for God's work and for his grace and glory to be displayed. And I'm not gonna curse God and give up. And I'm not gonna walk out And I'm not gonna shake my fist at him and say, if you won't give me what I ask for, we're done. But that somehow the beauty of our reliance becomes a platform for him to be displayed. Come on, aren't some of the most beautiful people who are Christ followers you've ever met those who have stuck with God when they didn't win? You see, Suffering doesn't necessarily bring God glory, but our response can. Well, I warned you we'd be in deep and we're in so deep now that Paul drags us down just a little deeper into it. This is how the text ends. He says, that is why for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And I gotta be honest, my, my first blush at this says, Paul, that's nonsense. Weak is weak. Strong is strong. Sick is sick. Healed is healed. Failure is failure. And success breeds more success. How can you claim some kind of strength flows out of your weakness? And Paul says, I have found a way to delight in my weaknesses because somehow God is being displayed to the world in my weaknesses. Somehow, I'm not going to get the fairy tale ending, Paul says. The loose ends aren't going to be tied up when the movie of my life plays the last frame. But that's okay. God's receiving glory. You know, one of the reasons we pay $12 for a ticket to go sit in a dark room and watch the motion picture of someone else's story because we love the fact that when it's all said and done, the loose ends are tied up and the victor wins and the bad guy gets what he deserves. We love that because it's escape. Because when the lights come back up 
and we throw that big old nasty buttered container away on the way out and go get in our car and drive back into the real world. We remember that in this real world, our oikos is full of people with broken bodies and broken promises and broken dreams. That while we would love to think all of us get to circle the bases in Yankee Stadium while everybody cheers and we point to heaven, in reality, our lives are full of a lot of strikeouts. And Paul says, when people saw that in me, they could associate and then they could hear me tell of a grace that carried me through. One of the people in that church in Corinth that Paul was writing to was a woman named Priscilla. She and her husband, Aquila, were very good friends of Paul and strong supporters of his ministry. There was a very special bond amongst them. It's believed that Priscilla wrote one of the books that we have in the New Testament. It's one that we later ended up calling Hebrews. And if you've ever read the book of Hebrews or know anything about it, there's a most famous chapter in there. It's chapter 11. I call it God's Heroes Hall of Fame. In it, Priscilla takes 35 verses to spell out the stories of great victories that God has won through his people, men and women alike. Some she takes a whole verse, sometimes she takes four or five, six verses to tell their story. But as Priscilla's writing and going story after story after story, she must have gotten to a point where she said, well, we're either gonna run out of ink or run out of time. So I need to sum up. And she goes into what I think is just this, this breathless, excited diatribe of joy. Uh, I bet the person who was penning it was like, slow down, slow down, slow down. But she just starts listing off just the names and the people have to associate the victory stories with the names. <laughs> Here's how she said it. Listen to this. She says, and what more shall I say? In other words, after all I've told you, I'm not done yet. I don't have time to tell about Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of the lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. And she says, what do I have to say? Win and win and victory again and again and again, but without even grabbing a breath in between. She says, others were tortured and refused to be released so that they might gain a better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging while still others were chained and put in prison. They were stoned. They were sawed in two. They were put to death by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute and persecuted and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and holes in the ground. These, she says, were all commended for their faith. These, she said, used the weaknesses and the struggles and the pains of their life as a platform for God's glory and his strength. Even though their meanwhile never ended, even though it became permanence, even though they laid it down in death, none of them received it and promised. God had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. God had planned something better for us. Inside of that us, she's saying, will be stories of suffering, of unresolved problem, of unhealed sickness on this side of glory. Pain and heartache and struggle that they took to their grave, but believed that God's grace was sufficient to carry them 
through. And as they died, not yet have received, here's what they knew. That there is an answered prayer awaiting. That we together with them would say, God's grace carried me and now here I am in his glory. I wish I could tell you that every struggle you face, that every meanwhile season you're in is going to come to an end. But today there may be one that you've already discovered. There's no way to undo it. It can't change. You may begin to sense, I think I'm going to have to carry this all the way. Paul says to you, that Jesus says sometimes no is a better answer than yes because his grace is sufficient. If you'll just bow your heads wherever you are, I feel unworthy to pray your prayer for you because it's you that needs to cry out to God today and say, Lord, I've asked you and I've asked you and I've asked you. But God, if you're not going to remove this, then please use this. Lord, I believe you have purpose in our pain. And I thank you today for your promise of grace for my life and for each life. We receive that promise today as a good thing. And we recognize, God, that even if we lose, even if we die, even if we suffer, these platforms are platforms for your glory and your grace to show through our lives. May it be so because we live in a world of loss. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. If you would like to know more about how you can enter into a personal relationship with this God who provides grace, then all you need to do is text the word Jesus to the number that's on the screen right now. One of our pastors is gonna call you right back, get an opportunity to pray with you and to invite you into that relationship with God. Maybe you say, I don't want that prayer, but there is something I need prayer about. Then you can just text the word pray and we will have someone give you a call back as well. God bless you. Thank you for joining us today for Church Online. We'll see you next weekend.